What's up? Tonight on Zinzerna, we're going to explore some drones from the Strega. We're going to explore some drones from the No Coast. Right now, we're listening to the Pulsar. Very low. How's it going, anybody? My name is P.T. Burnham. We're doing the Zinzerna Music Hour. Shout out to Cold Rhymes Records. I'm excited to get started tonight. We're going to have uh, Manly P. Hall rocking through the uh, delay pedals. Going to kind of keep them off of the rotators. You know, not going to mess with them too much. Just let it ride. And we're going to run these drums. A little bit of... Uh, Melody and, and and pianos going through the beads, module by mutable instruments, and also Mononoke running a bass layer drone. Not bass, but a nice pad for everything to rest in. I might also play with it a little bit. Yeah, definitely gonna play with that a little bit. Okay, so also, we've got these symbols. Now those are, uh, you know, physical objects. They're here behind me. I don't know if you can see these. Yeah, this is just the top of the symbol there. There's also a bell here that are mic'd up, so we got mics on those objects, and I think that about does it. We've got piano coming through here, but I'm not going to reveal that yet. It's a pleasure to be with you this evening, so I'm going to go in. Maybe we'll play the breather real quick, because this is definitely a breather type, while I start the Manly P. Hall. I think our discussion will move by talk. will be rather more than usually important. For well, we hope to bring in a quantity of material involving principles and points of doctrine we have never before discussed. And as a beginning, I would like to lay certain foundations. In the first place, however, we must bear in mind that it is easy in an obscure area to fall into opinion or to interpret somewhat more broadly than the facts justify, especially if we work from some basic conviction of our own. Therefore, I'm not going to Drink drinks, y'all. Especially if it's from the Zuna. Where possible, the historical facts and certain almost inevitable conclusions. Each person, however, should weigh these almost inevitable remarks with the same uh, criticism and judgment uh, that they would use in evaluating any body of evidence or circumstantial record. I want to deal first with two very interesting and unusual centuries. That 200-year period, from approximately 100 BC to 180. The more we become interested in comparative religion, the more we realize that this particular period has interest and importance 
in widely scattered areas of human culture. Of course, in the midst of this period, the Western world received the impact of Christianity. But it must also be borne in mind uh, that the Christian faith for the first two or three centuries was a minority doctrine, developing within a very restricted geographical and cultural area. We cannot therefore assume that Christianity of itself was responsible for all the other changes in distant regions, far from the possible contact with early Christian activity. Nor can we more readily assume that far and distant areas moved in upon the Mediterranean region uh, to completely change European culture. We must therefore be from a generality to be weighed and considered. We know that about 600 years before the beginning of the Christian era, a group of extraordinary religious and philosophical leaders arose within the space of a hundred years. Many of these men were contemporary. We were contemporaries, although Lao Tzu was the elder man. During the very lifetime of these men, India received Buddha, another of the great teachers of the world. We have been suspicious that there was a large nation of Persian culture about this time perhaps under the last of the Zoroaster, Newton said the Pythagoras of Samos was personally acquainted with. In Greece, the world of Pythagoras, he established the foundation of the great age of philosophy, which may well be termed the golden age of Greece. So, I got these. Here were, there were a variety of impulses granular chunks that are getting grabbed on the beads module that I haven't activated. They only activate when I push play. And they basically grab these pianos and turn them into granular chunks. What up? Raccoon love. Son of love. Fight back, Scorpio love. What's up, one infinite zoo? It is a pleasure to have you. We and evolve and develop systems of thought. We know what happened in Greece and how the Platonic philosophy rose definitely from the Pythagorean theory. We also realize that Pythagoreanism and Platonism became the dominant Mediterranean philosophy. And attained this distinction between the 4th century BC and the 1st century BC. We also realize that in China, the peculiar nature of Confucianism caused it to remain a very steady and comparatively unchanging Confucianism was almost totally an ethical conviction, and it could scarcely be changed or outlawed any more than we could actually change the golden rule. Its very structure did not permit it to become much involved in any religious or abstract formula. But Taoism, the teaching of Lao Tzu, at about the beginning of the Christian era, moved from a philosophical to a theological foundation. And we find a tremendous 
expansion of Chinese metaphysics, coinciding closely with, say, the first century uh, A.D. At about the same time, we find a tremendous internal change in the structure of Buddhism. We find as a result of the discovery of the mysterious secret books of Buddha in the Iron Tower by the Buddhist patriarch Nagarjuna. The Buddhism moves from a lofty philosophic agnosticism into a very involved, profound, and emotionally mature metaphysics with the advent of the Pure Land Doctrine, or the Northern School, Mahayana Buddhism. As soon as Mahayana arose, the entire course of Buddhist history changed. And while there are still groups clinging strongly to the old way, most of the progress in Buddhism has been the result of the Mahayana group operating in China, Korea, and Japan. They have represented the spearhead of the modernism of religion in Asia. About the same period, there were marked changes in Hinduism. Uh, the rise of mystical and transcendental schools for the interpretation of the ancient Vedic and Puranic uh, writings. This change was also an enlargement into mysticism, a tremendous growth of metaphysical speculation, and the development of systems of meditation and uh, various types of mystical experience doctrine which were to play an important part in Asiatic culture. Even while Christianity was in its infancy, its direction was abruptly changed at almost the same time by the ministry of St. Paul. Uh, the Christianity of the four Gospels has gradually been absorbed into the Christology of the epistles. And St. Paul stands forth as the first transform the moral code of Jesus into a highly transcendental universal doctrine of regeneration and redemption. Similar changes were occurring in Persian metaphysics, and we find the roots appearing also in Greek speculation. For about the beginning of the Christian era, the simple philosophic clarity of Plato's thinking, became involved in the highly mystical speculations of the Neoplatonists and the Neopythagoreans, who did in that melting pot of commerce and culture, the ancient North African city of Alexandria. Also in the same time, cross groups began to emerge, mingling Greek thought with thinking of Christianity and producing such peculiar uh, groups as the Gnostics and the followers of Maine, the Manichaean group. In all of these instances, one simple point stands out. The gradual transformation of older doctrine into highly mystical Revelations. Revelations that had one essential purpose behind them. And that was to change the concept of the transcendence of deity to the concept of the imminence of deity. This is a very important philosophical part. The mysterious God of old or the gatherings of ancient times, living in their remote Olympian or Sumerian Heights, uh, were a race of beings apart, inhabitants of heaven. But in this gradual change that took place, deity was transformed into an eternal power 
everywhere present, always invisible, beyond definition, yet immediately available to certain transcendent achievements of human consciousness. We know that this change marks not only uh, the shift in the psychological integration of the Mediterranean region, but it swept across the world. There are even vestiges of this change occurring in the Western Hemisphere among the primitive peoples, perhaps not so primitive peoples, of Central America. We find a gradual tendency to associate the rise of religious mysticism among the Mayas at a time approximating the beginning of the Christian era. This phenomenon was so remarkable that Lord Kingsborough, one of the greatest 19th century authorities on Central American culture, felt that it was almost certain that the mysterious deity Central Park, the Southern Circle, who came so strangely to Mexico, must have been one of the original apostles. In other words, there seemed no other way of explaining this, because there was no common communication between these people. Yet at almost one time, they all came to an almost identical conclusion, changed their entire religious course, and transformed the structure of religion from its archaic form to the type of religious understanding which we share and enjoy today. Now this obviously opens a very large area of speculation. There are many possible explanations, some rather impossible, which have still held a measure of faith. One broadly accepted uh, doctrine relating to this, or explanation for the circumstances, is the idea of coincidental emergence. We have parallels of this in simpler ways. We frequently hear, for example, of an invention that has been offered to the world. And it is not uncommon that the same invention shall appear in, the, in different places at the same time. Several persons coming to almost identical conclusions and at almost the identical moment. Therefore, the coincidence concept is not quite as loose as might first appear. For it is based upon the assumption that time is measured by a series of events, and that whenever a culture, or a group of persons, or a civilization passes through certain experiences, there are corresponding innovations in that nice culture, phase, phase, changes in its doctrines and yeah. beliefs. Perhaps the interval of 600 years between the advent of the great teachers and the beginning of the Christian era brought several nations or several culture groups to almost the same psychological platform. And there was no direction in which they could go except that direction which is most natural and common to human nature. Another explanation which requires perhaps a little more investigation is the concept that these changes were tied together. That actually there was greater commerce between these ancient cultures than we at this time assume to have existed. That it is quite possible that by the beginning of the Christian era, a degree of world thought had been established, particularly along the caravan route. And it is interesting that most of these innovations rose in regions along the caravan lines between Europe and Asia. Therefore, it is conceivable that Asiatics did visit uh, Western centers of learning. 
It is also quite possible that more Europeans visited Asia than we now realize. You know that Pythagoras was able in the 6th century B.C. to reach India. We know that the armies of Alexander the Great penetrated Asia. We do not know just how largely these motions contributed to world ideas. The one thing we can generally regard as undeniable that the world of cultured, civilized nations came to about the same ideas at almost the same time. Of course, to the uh, devout transcendentalist or metaphysician, there is no problem at all. All these things are handled by invisible forces beyond human comprehension. Uh, we do not deny such a possibility, but we also like to see, if possible, some uh, more simple and explainable procedure. Uh, these transcendental solutions belong to the divine emergency, and I would rather see, first, if we cannot find some common ground, or assume that these changes were made by at least partially natural means. I think we can rather well establish this. Now, you may wonder why all this has a bearing upon the Kabbalah and the doctrine of the early Jewish people. The importance lies in this very circumstance, namely, that Kabbalism is perhaps the broadest term that we have for Jewish transcendentalism. Kabbalism is to the old Orthodox Jewish belief, almost in the same relation as Mahayana Buddhism to primitive Buddhism in India, or the theological Taoism to the primitive absolutism of Lao Tzu. In each instance, we see the arising of a new point of view. And in the case of the Kabbalists, uh, this presents a semi-Western space for our examination. It is a rather compact package. It involves a limited group of persons Yet it is wonderfully symbolical of the entire world procedure. Not only are we concerned with these extraordinary coincidences and the timing, but we are also somewhat concerned with the internal symbolism of the various revelations that arose in a half a dozen areas of world culture at the same time. In the symbolism, we also seem to sense a relatedness. The symbolism would almost suggest that a number of people had read the same book or had become aware of the same basic facts or had attained to the same basic conviction and have then unfolded this illumination in terms familiar to their own people or in terms at least partly acceptable to the entrenched traditionalism of the areas in which they existed. Well, we must realize that all of these groups were opposed as they rose. They all passed through certain persecutions. They created resentment they were declared to be heretical by someone. And perhaps it was this very persecution that gave to each of them the strong substance of survival. When we know things under persecution develop a tremendous strength and an integration that can never be found in more fortunate uh, environments. So we have now a world 
situation. And I, I think that the Dead Sea Scrolls situation uh, more or less fits into this. Uh, these scrolls are soon to have been originally um, preserved or put away in the earth sometime in this interval between 100 B.C. and 100 A.D. We also have to remember that in these scrolls there are strong indications of a, of a heterodox attitude arising among Jewish mystical sects. I am no way convinced that these scrolls are Essene products. I do not think the Essenian community can be actually the source of them, although it may well have been the preserver of the old manuscripts. The Essenes themselves were transition groups between Orthodox Judaism and mysticism, and their entire history is noted only in these two mysterious centuries. After that, they disappear utterly from the pages of record and account. We do not know what happened, but they form part of this strange bridge of doctrine that seems to connect an old world with a new concept of life. How shall we distinguish this new concept of life, for instance, in terms of our Kabbalism? The great book of the Kabbalah, certainly its outstanding text today, is the Sefer HaZohar, or the Book of the Splendor. This was first given to the world around the 12th or 13th century by Rabbi Moses de Leon. He insisted that he transcribed it from an ancient work. For nearly 300 years, perhaps 400 years, historians have thrown the lie to his feet. They have said that Rabbi Moses wrote the work himself. But it has no root in antiquity. And probably little, if any, roots in tradition. However, in the last century, our broadening knowledge of world culture has caused a general change of opinion. And even so conservative a publication as the Encyclopedia Britannica which can never be said to give much benefit uh, to abstraction. Uh, their article on the Kabbalah uh, states as the modern point of view that it is very probable that Rabbi Moses of Leon either was in possession of an earlier manuscript or was in possession of a valid oral tradition and that in all probability he was perfectly honest and perfectly sincere and entirely truthful in attributing the Zohar to a very much earlier date than the medieval scholars had admitted. According to Rabbi Moses, this work was actually uh, written about the beginning of the Christian era, just at this particularly critical time during the reign of the Roman Emperor Vespasian. Persecuted by the Romans and by the more traditionally bound members of the Sanhedrin, Rabbi Simeon ben Yochoi retired to a cave with his son. And in this cave, he was visited by one of the angelic hosts. And through this angelic visitor and the intercession of the early prophets, he is said to have recorded the Book of the Splendors, the Sephar Azohar. We have at this time no reason to doubt that this book is a genuine midrash of Rabbi Semi. That is, it was a work prepared by him, or at least committed to memory as the result of instruction which he gave. 
this particular work changed the entire complexion of Jewish thought. It belongs just as certainly to this transition period as the wonderful book found by Nada Juna in the Iron Power in India at almost exactly the same date. All this adds to the concept that prevailed in the writings of Rabbi Simeon and in a parallel group of materials prepared by Rabbi Akiva. A little later followed Josiah, the most articulate philosophical spokesman of the Greek old Jewish school, uh, expanded this concept of Jewish mysticism far more uh, than had been previously possible and mingled its courses very closely with Neoplatonism. This was a very interesting time, a time of strange belief. Each people, in its own way, has explained the reason why that particular period should have produced these curious consequences. But there must have been some broader underlying generality which binds these together and makes them into one united idea. For example, among the teachings that arose among the Kabbalists and probably uh, may be traced back to Simeon ben Yokoi in the first century is the doctrine of Gilgulam. This particular doctrine is not commonly found in the West during the period of the so-called rise of capitalism. The word simply means the doctrine of rebirth. Now the Orthodox Jewish people uh, had certain beliefs about this, uh, but they were not at all clearly defined. It is held that the Pharisees did hold this doctrine in some estimation, and certain sects also regarded as high. But with the rise of Kabbalism, it burst upon the philosophic mind of Europe. Now here's one of the points which I think we are mentioning perhaps for the first time, and that is the descent of the doctrine of rebirth in Europe from the fall of the Greek school to the rise of modern knowledge. This doctrine was perpetuated in Europe. It was perpetuated not only by Jewish Catholics, but by Christian Catholics. And there was a thin thread of this belief, even in the Dark Ages, and in the period of the Renaissance, and down to the dawn of the modern way of thinking, with its indebtedness to Galileo, Harvey, Descartes, and other dawn thinkers of our modern generation. So this teaching suddenly flares up among the Jewish Christians. Why? How is it that a doctrine which had so little sympathy from their Christian neighbors and so little support from the Torah should have been developed in such exquisite detail in the Sefer HaZohar? This book was widely read and was widely influential among the literary-minded Jewish people. It attacked many principles of orthodox Jewry. It did not permit much of the psychological pattern that has always dominated Jewish personal and family life. It violated, in Good to have you with respect, us. at least the prevalent interpretation the of the Saint Torah and the Mosaic Code. Yet it flourished. Might be building up a little jump track here. In France, and was held by a large number of scholarly believers all the way down to the race of the Medicis and the Borgias. It's almost incredible to assume 
that a whole series of these dots moving west. Doctrine which were essentially so close to the Asiatic pattern of life could simply have come from nowhere or merely represented the speculations of single persons. Here we have another example of the development of tradition. These traditions bore very heavily upon the nature of the divine being at the root of life. And in the rise of the Zohar, we see the Jewish concept of deity undergoing marked changes. Changes which were later to profoundly influence the Christian faith. How did these changes arise and where did they come from? Were they indigenous to Europe or the Near East, or did they come from far east? As time goes on, I believe the general tendency will be to suspect far Asia. I think we will gradually be forced by the development of more adequate records uh, to recognize that religion is a common motion and that it is like a river. It may flow through one country, but have its headwaters in another. And this um, diffusion of ideas was possible at the time with which we are most concerned. And it is very possible that the reason for the sudden outburst of similar doctrines in a sordid region came as the result of the maturing or developing of more adequate travel facilities, particularly uh, the increase of caravan trade. Uh, the trade was to provide luxuries for the Romans and the Latins, but the byproduct was the communication of ideas. So these traders brought with them their beliefs and their doctrines. We know that this trading process a few centuries later was to be the principal foundation for the rise of Islam. But for our present concern, I think the transformation of the nature of fear is the first matter to be considered. Our primitive ancestors gradually passed from the worship of nature to the worship of spirit, from the recognition of visible forces to the so I got this of physical bell ringing here. Or beyond, or beyond these forces. Y'all let me know if that's too loud. These causes themselves Sounds good in my pass through innumerable reformations on the part of man. As his experience increased, it became essential to revise his theology, to keep his theology abreast of his intellectual achievements and his physical experiences. Gradually the concept of deity as represented in the Mosaic Code took form, not in one area but in many areas. And deity emerged as a being, a transcendent person. As the system was patriarchal, the deity assumed the aspect of the great father power. It was usually personified or impersonated as a most venerable person, a great superhuman being. A being, however, fashioned in the likeness of a man. A being like the mysterious and noble figure casting from his hands the sun and moon as represented on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in Rome. This being was the great patriarch and was compounded out of the elders, the heroes of long ago, the fathers of tribes, the venerated sages and scholars, the great priests and saints of long ago. All of these contributed their parts to the creation of the God image 
and this God in him was great of power, universal of authority, but subject, like the creatures of fashion, to the whimsies of disposition and temperament, subject naturally uh, to favoritism in bringing particular advantage and security to its chosen people. This God image was remote, like perhaps the great golden figure of Zeus at Olympus. It was power, but it was a power in figure, a power with which man could have very little intimate understanding association. It was a power that ran all things according to its own will. And in this power, men were but pawns in a great game. The gods could sweep away men merely by the will to do so. And these gods lived in a heaven world or region far from the abode of men, even though, like ancient Odin, they occasionally seated themselves upon the throne of all seers and looked out upon the world to see that it was still in order. We find this kind of deity not only the arising in the Near East, but having already arisen in other ancient regions as Egypt, India, and China. We find roots of it in the nature worship of Japan, Shinto. We see, therefore, God as the answer. We see God as the Ancient One. And we also live in a world ruled by certain inscrutable laws and processes, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This God was a God of justice and of vengeance. This was the deity who men did not dare to offend. They could respect, they could fall in awe before the thought of image of this God, but they could not meet it with personal affection. It was too distant and too far, too high, too remote, to have any immediate part in the workings of the world. This concept also had another frailty about it men, as they grew wiser, began to contemplate. It was a weak For this deity, living alone in an inscrutable, internal remoteness, was assumed to be the parent of creation. In the first place, man was unable to explain how or even why. God should create. There seemed to be no particular reason for it, and the more men studied the creation, particularly other men, the more doubt they had in the divine wisdom in creating man in the first place. There were many legends that deity so repented of this optimistic moment uh, that he swept away his creation time and time again. This uh, problem also caused the great question to arise, from what was creation fashioned? Did creation actually emerge as a result of a divine fiat spoken in yeah, you're hearing the delay with it. by some vast shadowy being like that portrayed by Gustave Doré in some of his wonderful Painting. Was creation from something or nothing? From what did the eternal... Yeah, one infinite zero, fashion. check this out. This is the, that uh, was the thing I was created? mentioning last week where the bell been. is ringing and triggered along with it is a synthesizer sound that is in tune with it but a little more rugged people. and with a lot of weird gritty like character running through itself. another delay. So it sounds no like the bell is delaying no with this weird sort of other universe the problem of feel, it's not really the bell sound that's 
the fashioning of a world. By this strange and mysterious power, confused and confounded the ablest thinkers of all time. They could uh, figure nothing more than a symbolical answer, like the tossing off of the sun in front and the moon behind. This, however, did not fully satisfy the rising realization of the principles of astronomy. There had to be some other explanation. This explanation uh, needed also a warm And if we look back on primitive religion, we see that there was an astonishing lack of real warmth. Men worshipped, but some way this worship was like the respect of a small child to an overstern parent. It was a respect of fear. This deity was wonderful and awful. It was a being which no one dared to offend. It was a father, however, in name only, for no one brought their troubles to this father. They brought offerings, they propitiated, they prayed, but they never felt a kinship with infinite life. This was long regarded as one of the basic weaknesses of Greek religion. Of all the religions of that period, probably the Greek was the most pleasant. It was the happiest. It was a worship of nature, and the rituals were well arranged, so there were festivities for every season. But even so, this did not represent a real sense of intimate experience. It was not until the rise of the authors that the human being in Greece had any real spiritual significance. He died and became a shadow. He had neither punishment nor reward in the world to come. He came forth as a flower and was cut down. It was only after philosophy began to ripen these concepts and the human heart began to sense an internal need that it turned away from the strange theological materialism of antiquity. This does not mean that the ancients had no God, but they had no personal God experience. They only worship before the temple. They never seem to go in to find that which was hidden in the Adita. They did not walk with God. Perhaps the old story that before the fall of man, God walked in the garden in the cool of the evening, carried some remembrance of other and better ways. But in the great rise of theology, God did not walk with men. He ruled them. He governed them. He punished them and rewarded them according to his own will and fancy. Now it is quite possible that at a certain degree of cultural insight, many nations simultaneously outdo this concept. We know that most of the countries where these changes were comparatively advanced in their sciences, their literature, their art, their poetry, their drama, and in their morality and ethics. Regardless of this particular point, however, we know they all did come to this immediate sense of a great and wonderful being. To meet this need, a new type of thinking had to be devised. For there was a very big problem, one that the modern world probably will never fully comprehend, or with which we may again be confronted one of these days when we make a sudden 
shift from materialism to idealism. If we produce a culture which remains materialistic for several centuries, and then this culture out of emergency within itself seeks to reestablish its own spiritual foundation, we may know something of what these people went through 2,000 years ago because it required a tremendous shift of perspective. One of the important uh, phases of this shift was the relationship between the individual and his own personal responsibilities. In the ancient world, the gods bestowed or withheld. Their ways were not only inscrutable, but as far as man is concerned, unreasonable. Take there it easy, baby. No particular way Have of a good explaining. night. Why the unjust seem to flourish and the just to suffer. There seemed to be no reasonable explanation for the disasters and tragedies of human existence. Therefore, it seemed reasonable to assume that a deity, perhaps with insight beyond our own, was the administrator of all of this wonderful complexity. But about the beginning of the Christian era, there came into existence the tremendous sense of personal responsibility for destiny. It shines out at us through all of these different systems. Man's faith moves slowly into man's own keeping. This was not a sudden move, but it was a rapid one. And in this concept, it was necessary to revise previous attitudes. So we see a, a marked change in uh, a number of beliefs. One of these marked changes included the rise of at least an archetypal form of the messianic dispensation. All of these peoples suddenly became aware of a power of intercession in space. This is particularly obvious in the Jewish instance. For among these people, the power of intercession had been comparatively slightly developed as a doctor. But among the Kabbalists, it arises in a very powerful way. We find also in India, the strict teachings of Buddha um, are enlarged. Uh, Buddha passed through two processes after his death. By one of these processes, he was deified. And by the other process, he was, as we will say, absorbed into a structure of bodhisattva, of celestial being and attendance <coughs> to minister to the spiritual needs of mankind. A savior concept emerged. Now at almost exactly the time <coughs> of the rise of the mystical dispensation in Christendom, the uh, Buddhist concept evolved their belief in a deity whom they called Amitabha, the Buddha of boundless life. This Amitabha power uh, was seated like a remote deity in the effulgency of space. But Amitabha was not a god in fact or substance. Amitabha was a human being deified by merit. After Amitabha has preserved his vow, or kept his great vow, which he made before attaining to the estate of an Arhat, he became uh, the ruler of the Golden Land, the land of peace, the New Jerusalem of Christianity, the 
city more square, represented often in this actual way in China, Tibet, and Japan. Amitabha then caused to emerge from his own nature the Bodhisattva Avalokitesvara, his beloved son. This Bodhisattva became his representative, his intercessor. And it is in the keeping of this Bodhisattva that Amitabha entrusted his world. And it was the duty and responsibility of Avalokitesvara to bring all souls to salvation through the grace of his own nature. Now this concept was in vogue in Asia, rising mysteriously and miraculously in the first century A.D. Avalokita's father later becomes a male-female being, nice. and in China and Japan is often disassociated entirely from its masculine attributes to become Kuan Yin or Kan Nan, a purely feminine representation, now depicted carrying a small child in her arms. And uh, this particular circumstance so disconcerted the first Christian missionaries in the area that they were convinced that in some way these people were perverting the idea of the Virgin Mary. But here we have this concept arising on the opposite side of the world. We have a similar concept gradually unfolding into the later religion of the Egyptians where a comparatively unimportant local deity, Osiris, finally became the principal deity of Egypt, and uh, then became the father of his own mysteriously, immaculately conceived son, Horus, who in turn becomes the savior of the world. The story of Horus is almost identically, the, in function, the story of Avalokita's father. We find also in many other systems either personified beings representing salvation, as in the emergence of the Persian Smithers. But we also find the rise of doctrines of salvation revealed by beings who so loved mankind that they opened the royal roads of revelation. The whole picture fits together in a strange and interesting manner. Now in the beginning of Amidaism, as it is called in Japan, or the doctrine of Amitabha, we have the meaning. The Amitabha exists in two forms in Chinese Tibetan philosophy. One is Amitabha, the, the builder of boundless life. The other is Amitayas, the builder of boundless life. These two are reflexes of each other, and in the Tibetan art are regarded as aspects of one being. And the word was light, and the light was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended the light. This is practically a Christian statement of Buddhist philosophy. Now how does these doctrines get across? Or, let us go to the Kabbalah. The Kabbalists no longer accept the mysterious name of deity. It is concealed under the acrostic of the Petrogramophone, or the great name of four letters, which we have translated Jehovah. They declare that the mysterious power at the root of life, the ancient of days, that power which is eternal and immediate, is of a triadic nature, represented by three words, age, boundlessness. That is that which is foreverness of its own eternal nature. That which goes on without beginning or end, representing an essence 
a principle unchanging unto infinity. That never this power was born, that this power shall never die. But very much like the effort made by Aristotle to establish the causelessness of first cause, simply represents the fact that causation is itself eternal. That causation is both a motion and a substance, existing forever. This is almost identically the statement of Lao in, des in describing the nature of Tao. And this was the same doctrine which at the beginning of the first century took over in China. At about the same period that we find it rising in North Africa, the Near East, and Southern Europe. Out of the nature of age comes a soul. And Ain soul is the boundless life. And out of the boundless life comes Ain Sophia in the ancient Kabbalah. And that is the boundless life. So being life and life constitute the basic triad of the Kabbalah. Being life and life constitute the basic triad of Mahayana Buddhism. There is no essential difference. There is only such difference as would be inevitably the result of translation from one language to another. So Buddhism no longer remains a doctrine of the world of illusion and the total reality of a nirvana beyond. It now became a world filled with being, life, and life. And this triad became gradually further sanctified out of the nature of Amitabha, Amitabha, by the rise of this triad consisting of Amitabha, Avalokitesvara, and Vaisesa. The, the being, this being consists of essence, of a super substantiality a changelessness. And this being exists in the innermost and the furthermost. It is diffused beyond dimension. It is called a zoic, in that it has no place nor placelessness. This being then suddenly steps out of the heavens as a person and steps into the atom. And that is where the Chinese put it. That is where the Hindu put it. And that is where Buddha himself said it was, because he actually referred to the atom by name in one of his discourses. Thus we have now a power as an absolute diffused end or quality. A power of which nothing can be either more distant or more proximate. That actually, therefore, deity is the substance from which all substances arise. Deity is substance and substantiality. Deity is not only the creator, but in his own nature and substance, the very material of creation. Therefore, God truly creates all things within his own likeness. And within this likeness, all things live and move and have their being. You can see quickly how this would shift the perspective and transcendence up on the Patreon this coming Or instead of here to you want to get here or there, it's Patreon.com one of the great problems of Omar Kaya. Deity is always everywhere. The Hindus gradually develop the concept in relation to Brahman. Yeah, I mean, to be and a three or four-headed deity seated on a lotus and became the symbol of the all-pervading presence of universal substance. Now when we refer to substance,
this case, we do not mean matter. By substance, we mean that which is substantial, or has a reality in itself. That which is not substantial is that to which a reality must be conferred. Therefore, that which is in itself innately, the cause, the substance, the sustenance, and the power of itself may be said to be substantial. Next this week we'll be going in on the recorded material from last month, checking out the own ET that I made. Properties. Therefore, every inconceivable or conceivable unit of energy or of substance or of essence anywhere in existence was itself triadic, consisting in its own nature of the essential completeness of the Godhead. This Godhead being the principle of being, the principle of life, the principle of life. The, the ancients, and especially the Kabbalists, of course, would never leave even such words as life and light without going into the gematria and the notaricon of them. They had to go into the mystery, for to them everything was a mystery. Every example of life was mysterious in this sense, as they themselves expressed it, that mystery is the vestment of eternity. Therefore, to discover reality, we must always penetrate mystery. If we penetrate mystery, we become wise. If mystery penetrates us, we become stupid. It is a very simple principle, but a very interesting one. Therefore, we are continually seeking to penetrate mystery. And in this mystery, we are seeking substance, essence, nature, being. To this trying nature, therefore, it became appropriate to bestow the term, the Ancient of Days. It became a symbol of absolute antiquity, as a solution to a problem. For to man, the problem of cause was more insignificant and more difficult than the problem of continuance. It would be simple to conceive of deity as ever-present under this system. But it would be more difficult to use this concept to explain first cause. Therefore, in their interpretation, the Kabbalists began to explore the meanings of life, life, and being in order to answer these essential questions. We have already more or less summarized their idea of being or being. The absolute profundity, the eternity of being. Not an eternity so here we of time go. alone, but an eternity of condition and an eternity of limitlessness. Gotta say thank you to my us So that this eternity had within it at all times the roots cats. and rudiments of an emergence or a coming Eric forth. Ponson. Thus Mother the Pythagoreans gradually Kenny developed Creech. the the concept of the uh, being as cats. seminal or full of seeds. Huge thanks like the mysterious statues of Serapis and Alexander, Viz. the body What's of which was covered with growing plants. Gotta talk to you soon. Life Eric Akers, people. See you soon. Dog men, fuck. The emergence What's of up? active, Jen Dudley, Wayne process. Anderson, Austin Katz, Scarlett Herrera. Things become alive when they Thank you very move. much for your support. When and they bear fruit. When they continue. The first food. manifestation Berry of cat. life is involved with continuance. Everything is removed. Therefore, absolute Nothing life is, true. is absolute. Let's go in in that spirit and it disintegrate this. It to essence or total immortality. Disintegrate these drones, uh, see what we can do to destroy them. Manifested the as a continuing unfoldment of the divine nature within itself, from itself, and by means of its own power. Light to these ancient people carried more than the illumination of the sun or the separation between day and night. 
light to them was the light of internal comprehension. Therefore, into this mystery of creatures was introduced the element of comprehension, so that these creatures could know, could be aware, could ultimately become conscious. And the end of life was that it should reveal the nature of the creating power. For the final purpose of life was that it should reveal truth. And truth in this system is nothing more than the total statement of the reality of being. Consequently, they had a very interesting and dynamic uh, interpretation of what had once been an almost unassailed uh, vastness of speculation. Uh, no man had dared to think of Zeus as other than an ancient bearded tyrant. But now came this new concept, the concept of the God of the Kabbalah as Appropriate, repre appropriately represented as paternity because of the absolute paternity of being. But this paternity now manifested to an absolute involvement in creation. In this way, it was possible to bridge the mysterious interplay between God and man. It brought God and man together somewhere. And it also brought creation and creator uh, into the power of creating, which was their common uh, meeting place. This concept made way for mysticism as we know it. It made way for the possibility of the God experience to man. For if God dwelt in man as a, an essence, uh, embodying or containing life and light, then this essential being could be, under some condition, knowable by man. Now the problem of knowability uh, in recognize this uh, important special phase. Namely, that to know a thing, one must be that thing which is known. And man's power to know God resides in the beingness of God in man. Man is therefore truly an expression, interpretation, revelation, not of himself, but of deity. And all things are merely deity unfolding its own eternity. We find traces of Neoplatonism here. We find traces of Buddhism, of Hinduism. We find a whole variety of ancient beliefs moving in and forming a unit within this rising Kabbalistic concept of existence. The next point, naturally, was the effort to establish a practical working definition of deity. The Kabbalists evaded this, as nearly all other mystics have, on the ground of incomprehensibility. Actually, the only power which can be aware of itself is deity. All other powers have to be essentially aware of something that is not so. Therefore, man's inability to find his own source apart from God. The individual trying to be himself achieves nothing because this self cannot be known apart from God due to the fact that this true self is God. This is a Buddhist point also. That the individual seeking to posit his own nature at the root of life simply desecrates the divine. The individual rises from his own causes. As this is the essential principle of this
Acoustic Fire, video and audio, proudly presents Terrence McKenna. Alright, we can go with a little Terrence McKenna as we pull this off. Why not? History ends in green. Oh, place 
in the animal body of, of mankind. It's not an intellectual strategy or a rational strategy. This is what happens whenever a society is slammed to the wall. It unconsciously reaches back through its history or its mythology for a steadying metaphor. Now, the last time this happened in the West and worked was at the time of the collapse of the medieval Christian eschatology, at the time of the rise of urbanization and banking and secular society. Uh, the model of the Christian universe was no longer serviceable. And very suddenly, philosophers, politicians, social planners reached into the past for classic models. And this was in the 16th, 15th and 16th century. And they created classicism, the revivification of Roman law, Greek architecture, Greek polity, all of this happened a thousand to fifteen hundred years after these things had been completely abandoned. But then they became the basis for modern secular civilization and our laws are our Greco-Roman and our architecture and our aesthetic and so forth and so on. Well, the way this is happening in the 20th century is, number one, at a much more deep and profound level because it's a global reflex. The entirety of modern civilization has shot its wand in some sense. You know, from the, from the perspective of 500 years, a society that cannot put bread on its grocery shelves, such as the Soviet Union, and a society such as our own that is three trillion dollars in debt, the difference is negligible. I mean, both of these societies are functionally bankrupt. So we're living through and have been living through throughout the 20th century uh, an experience of the dissolution of boundary and form. Everything has been in a state of flux throughout the 20th century. I mean, it opens with the concept of the Edwardian gentleman and lady firmly in place, class structure, class privilege, race privilege, sex privilege, the entire structure of uh, the assumptions of the post-medieval world are in place and functioning. Now, 90 years later, none of this is in place. And to my mind, the, uh, the major factor working to achieve this end has not been the two world wars or the exploration of the unconscious by Dada and surrealism or the breakdown of uh, classical design mores or any of this stuff. It's been the psychedelic experience. The psychedelic experience is a genuine um, paradigm shattering phenomenon. We claim that we want this. This is what lies behind the love of flying saucers and, uh, you know, the Loch Ness monster and all of this. We want a paradigm-shattering object, piece of evidence, body of testimony, something like that. But what we don't realize is we have it. We have it, as somebody over here on this side of the room said, you know, it's a matter of courage, and this places it in a special, uh, in a special mode. It's not something where we can just validate it and then, uh, you know, found an institute and appoint experts and expect them to issue a report. It's something actually at the center of our being, and. My motivation for talking to audiences like this is simply that I, it, I cannot conceive of mature human beings going from the cradle to the grave without ever finding out about this. I mean, it's not like not finding out about sex or something. 
you know? It's just too weird. It's a part of our birthright. It's not a cultural artifact. It's not like being able to ride a bicycle or something like that, where you can imagine that pygmies or Amazonian Indians go from birth to grave and they never ride a bicycle and they never miss it. But this is a little more existentially front and center than that. I mean, this is, as far as I can tell, the uh, dimension in which we most fully experience ourselves as ourselves. Well, you know, culture, we have to be very careful about the, uh, the corrosive effects of culture. Some of you may know about these, uh, this was reported in Time magazine a month or two ago, about these forms of salamanders that never, if the conditions of alkalinity in the lakes are at a certain level, they never mature into the adult form. They actually...
to understand this now, if not actually do something about it. H.G. Wells said, uh, history is the race between education and catastrophe. Well, never more so than today, because the world is set on a course of catastrophe. The emotional constipation and rigidity of the past thousand years that has set us up as territorial apes with thermonuclear arsenals, all of that is just set to, uh, you know, go critical. Nevertheless, you know, we are minded creatures in the presence of uh, an evolving and rapidly shifting landscape of problems. And uh, I think that uh, it's a very hopeful sign to look around and notice that the only barrier to the solution of our problems are intellectual barriers, barriers in our own mind. We have the money, the technology, the mass communication, the scientific expertise, the remote sensing telemetry. What we don't have is the, the will to self-direct all of this technical apparatus toward a rational solution of our problem. But that means that the solution to our problems lies almost entirely in the human domain. And the human domain is the area where we observe the uh, highest rate of unpredictable perturbation. So I don't see the situation as uh, determined or desperate at all. The mushrooms take on on the chaos of the end of history is this is what it's like when a species prepares to depart for the stars. It is chaotic, but it is not disordered. It is more like a bird than anything else. There is rending of tissue. There is a sense of crisis, of un, uh, unstoppable forward motion. But it turns out, all according to plan, all to uh, an end, the trick is to somehow attain this vision of the order correctness of what is happening when it seems so chaotic, and then to um, template it, to strengthen it each for ourselves, and then to replicate it and communicate it as a mean, because um, there is no percentage in paralysis here at the brain. The only possibility is uh, of some kind of forward escape. You know, a forward escape is when you attain the goal by simply rushing through the And I think that this history that is a race between education and catastrophe is going to turn out to be a forward escape. There will be a moment of complete abandonment to the irrational. And we will look tomorrow at the timeline and look at Saddam Hussein and his role in all of this. But he is not the final act. This is somewhere late in Act 1 of this malarkey that we're having to put up. But Agniyant, which in this case means downstream time, uh, we will uh, sprout all our work that we look from the human through uh, before we get there. I guess I should say just a little bit about my, how I got into this. And uh, I think curiosity is probably the ultimate value my cosmology. It's, it's what's gotten me anywhere I've ever been. It's the only impulse that I trust completely. And uh, it's alive in most people as children, but it gets somehow squelched or misdirected or something. And uh, so when I look back through my own life, I see this psychedelic impulse before there was ever a word or a name for what it was. Uh, and I've tried to think back as far back as I can. And I have very early memories, like up to the eighth month, but they don't seem to relate to this. But I remember in... I was born in 46, it must 
illustrations in it, and one of the illustrations was of a hooded figure um, gazing into a crater. And this, I got it somehow as an image of, uh, of the strain the other track. And I think this is the other thing that for me with the book and the psychedelic was a kind of deep Irish love of uh, the weird from the very get-go. Uh, so curiosity and the love of uh, the weird, the edge, the bizarre. And uh, this led me into, and I guess maybe a certain, a certain degree of obsessive character. I mean, I'm spending time on this because I'm trying to understand the psychedelic personality generally. But I did have a tendency to really focus in on whatever I was into. And I think the first thing was uh, rocks. And this was, uh, you know, it was for me an introduction into the size of time because it wasn't just any rocks that interested me. It quickly became clear that it was fossils. And I lived in western Colorado, and I could go out into these dry arroyos and bring back dateable objects, uh, 170 million years old, you know, stack them up and look at them. So then I got this dizzy And, you know, there are those little museum pamphlets where it shows a billion years and then the last million years is up here and then it goes down here and spreads out and then the last 10,000 years. I got that. I assimilated this notion of deep, deep time. And then, uh, you know, it was almost like an intellectual ontogeny recapitulating phylogeny because the rocks, the inanimate mineral world, soon couldn't confine this restless imagination. So then it became about insects, butterflies specifically, moths especially, as an excuse to be alone in the middle of the night around bright lights, uh, you know, with cyanide. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I don't know if any of you have ever been touched by this particular obsession, but because we're insectivores, because our food-getting habits are wired into a brain 50 million years old in the insect-gathering habit, you know, this is a very deep, almost orgasmic response that you can touch in the human organism. And I pursued it again and again in life so, to the point where I did it as a professional in the jungles of Indonesia and the Amazon. And, and uh, you know, it's horrifying to tell in Buddhist company, but when you come upon one of these uh, long-winged iridescent ornithopterids, the sort that Barangi de Rothschild uh, sent his collectors out for in the late 19th century, and you come upon one of these things hanging under a leaf, looking for all the world like it weighs at least half a pound, and, you know, wrestle it into your neck. It's as close to having a heart attack as... Uh, as I ever want to get. And then this thing, at some point, I, I did a lot of reading, and at some point I discovered that I had defined myself narrowly, and that I was turning into a scientist. And I was reading people like Henry James and Aldous Huxley, and they were sneering at what I was becoming and talking about a mysterious realm of human thought called the humanities, which I had no notion of what this was. I couldn't even figure out what it possibly could be. Well, then I discovered it meant music, painting, architecture, dance, philosophy, design, in short, the human world. 